That's great. So that that looks great. Thank you so much for that nice introduction, Nathan. And it's my pleasure um, to give a seminar uh, as as part of the Northwest Quantum Nexus uh, seminar series. And so today um, I'm going to focus on engineering quantum defects uh, for quantum network applications. As an overview of today's talk, I want to give an introduction, a broad introduction to, to what quantum networks are and why we would like to use crystal defects as nodes in these types of networks. Um, I'll then talk about how we make and characterize quantum defects, which is a, a question that I'm often asked when people find out that I study these types of defects, and then how we integrate them into uh, devices for certain applications. And then finally, I, I would just like to leave people with a taste of um, how large this area is and how much more there is to discover uh, for quantum applications. OK, so um, in this introduction, I want to I want to uh, address what is a quantum network? What properties do we want in a node and why defects and what defects? So if you just go on the Internet and search up quantum network, you'll see uh, something that that looks like the picture that I'm showing here uh, where you can see that there are nodes, they're bright and they're they're linked by light. So this is just a, a uh, artist rendition of what a quantum network might look like. Uh, if we if we think about what we think of as a quantum network in, in quantum information science and technology, these nodes can be uh, two things. One is that they can simply be a quantum transmitter, something that transmits quantum states. These would naturally be photons. And by quantum states, we mean that they can be in a superposition of zero and one. So it is in a qubit. And these can be um, entangled between different directions and then they can be detected classically. So that's a very, very simple node. It can also consist of a quantum memory. And in this particular case, there is a, a qubit here that can store this, this quantum information. And for most of my talk, I'm interested in defects as a quantum memory in these nodes. Then these nodes in this network are connected by channels. And these channels can sometimes represent just a direct transfer of qubits. So single photons are, are flying through these and perhaps uh, detected by a classical receiver. Other times, these edges can represent entanglement or quantum correlated states between these nodes. So if this edge exists, it means that there is a non-classical correlation between the quantum bit in this node and the quantum bit in this node. That is, these nodes are entangled. And this is the main motivation for, for the networks that, that I'm going to discuss today. And so there's there's a couple of, of main applications for quantum networks. One is in communication. And here again, uh, this is a, an artist rendition of the Internet. Um, but what quantum information uh, would allow and what a, a long distance uh, quantum network would allow is a fundamentally secure Internet. And throughout this talk, because I do want it to be somewhat general, uh, I am giving uh, references, often review articles for people that want to delve in more deeply into some of the topics that I'm that I'm introducing. So there's there's a communication aspect and fundamentally secure communication. And then there's also a computing aspect. And this is the, the concept of distributed quantum computing where you have small quantum processors that are then linked in a network uh, to, to other small quantum processors. And what, what some people uh, may not realize is that it was, it was shown um, back in 2000 that a quantum network like this, where you have these quantum correlated uh, connections between uh, nodes can be used to do an arbitrary quantum computation. So in this particular sketch, we see uh, a quantum circuit, a quantum computational circuit. And then here on the right, it's represented in this graph state notation as a network. And so if we think, what do we want in one of these nodes? One of your first thoughts 
might be an atom because an atom uh, can emit light. We can imagine connecting these nodes and it also can store information in its quantum mechanical states. Right? And in fact, trapped ions and cold atoms are, uh, are qubits, um, are qubit platforms today. But we can also look in, in the solid state, and this is quite nice because this has, um, this has a, a form factor that we can fabricate and make devices out of. And if you take a perfect crystal, and we could call this semiconductor vacuum in this case, and remove an atom or two atoms, in this case we remove two carbons out of diamond, and replace one of nitrogen and left one carbon spot, lattice site empty, you will also get these quantized energy levels in which it's possible to store quantum information. The type of level structure that we want, um, so this is an abstract energy level diagram of, of one of these atomic-like defects, is shown here where you have a, a lower state where you can store the, the qubit states zero and one or an arbitrary superposition of the two. And then at least one of the states is coupled to an optical transition that allows you to connect the nodes through photons. So this is the ideal. Of course, just as with atoms, life is, is a bit more complicated. And here you can see what's known about the nitrogen vacancy center, and this is the negatively charged nitrogen vacancy center energy level structure. Um, and it is, it is quite complicated. There's many, many more levels than the simple three level diagram that I show here. And there's also interactions with lattice vibrations or phonons. But what we can do is still spectrally isolate and address uh, three levels in this diagram in order to do the types of protocols that I'm talking about. Okay. So once we've isolated this type of atomic qubit structure with this optical transition for network applications, we can ask what do the properties of this, of this defect need to have? And one of them is that it has a long qubit coherence. And we represent the qubit state as this coherent superposition between zero and one. And what that means is that there's an amplitude and a relative phase between these two. Um, and the lifetime of the amplitude and phase uh, determines how long you can store the information. So for, for trapped ions, and these are all, I'm showing you world records and some, some famous platforms. In the trapped ions, the, the world record is held by barium, and this is 10 minutes. Um, the superconducting uh, transmon qubit has just uh, broken its record. This is an archive uh, paper which shows they can now get to 0.3 milliseconds. And what may be surprising is actually a defect in, in a crystal can um, rival these significantly. In, in fact, the phosphorus dopant in silicon is 39 minutes. That's the, the record for storing information in this defect system. Now, uh, just like there's many different trapped ions and different geometries, and there's different types of superconducting qubits, these are just the records for one type. This is the record for one particular defect in a very, very pure material. This, this defect does not have the optical transitions that we want for network applications. It's a contender uh, for, for uh, non-networked quantum computing applications. Defects themselves in crystals can range from picoseconds up to this, up to these minute time scales. So there's a huge range depending on the defect and type of material of what type of quantum memory you can have. Okay. And then the next thing that we need, other than these these very stable long-lived memory states, is this optical transition. And what we typically do in the lab is we excite the the defect and we look at the photoluminescence that's emitted from the defect. And so here you can see the intensity of the light that's emitted as a function of the wavelength of the light. And 637 nanometers is the transition of interest for the nitrogen vacancy center for these types of applications. And it's a very, very sharp line that's called the, the zero phonon line. And this, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, but this zero phonon line has been used for creating small scale 
um, quantum networks. And this is around, this, this uh, wavelength is in the red. Okay. And then the other thing that we need is multiple qubits per node with local operations. And this is pretty important because it turns out that generating these edge states is always probabilistic. Even if you have a protocol that's deterministic and there's 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 only one protocol that I know that is that that is theoretically deterministic, you're still always going to lose photons. It's very, very hard not to have any photon loss. So there's always going to be some probability that the edge is not created when you do the protocol to create the edge. So if you're trying to make a very, very large graph state, the probability of success is going to quickly go to zero because it's it's because of the finite probability for each link. Because of this, what you can do is have schemes that use multiple qubits and swap entanglement and then herald when you create an edge. And these are very, very powerful algorithms. They do require local, uh, local qubit registers. And uh, the record um, in Diamond for achieving these types of local qubit registers is with the Nitrogen Vacancy Center in Diamond, that defect I introduced a few slides ago, where they have actually, um, a group uh, in Delft has shown that uh, you have your nitrogen, you have your vacancy, but you're also given in Diamond some 13 Cs. And this, this, this isotope of carbon, uh, it's about 1% of all the carbon in the Diamond lattice, uh, has a spin. And this spin can also be used to store information. So a 10 qubit register showing seven uh, qubit entanglement has been achieved uh, with the nitrogen vacancy center in diamond. So this is a promising way to use defects to have these small quantum registers. And then the final requirement is that you need these defects, if I have two different nitrogen vacancy centers, they need to emit identical photons. And that's another way to say is that their energy structure needs to be identical. And to zeroth order, defects are identical because uh, a nitrogen vacancy center in, in one part of the diamond should be the same as in another part of the diamond, which should be the same as if someone else looks in their diamond sample. Similar other types of defects that are used for these applications are the silicon vacancy center in diamond. Uh, people are looking at single vacancies and dye vacancies in silicon carbide. Um, and also uh, rare earth doped crystals are also uh, contenders for these applications. So to zeroth order, everything's identical. That's a good starting point. But even if the actual NV center is identical, you can imagine just a few lattice sites away there can be another defect. And that defect, because it can be so close to this um, NV center, can cause the microscopic environment to be slightly different, and so the energy is slightly different. And here's uh, an example highlighting this type of difference where we have actually this little integrated circuit that you see here, and underneath each one of these disks, we have NV centers, and these NV centers are emitting light, and then we're collecting that light out of this uh, grading structure right here. And when we do that, and we're exciting many of these NV centers, what we see is that they're emitting at all slightly different wavelengths. Um, this is because the electrostatic environment is a little different because there are these defects. And actually in this particular experiment, what we did was we applied electrodes and we actually use these electrodes to see if we can control deterministically somewhat uh, the electrostatic environment. Um, additionally, uh, this is another example. This is the silicon vacancy center, where again, if you look, you can see that each one is emitting at a little bit of a different wavelength. And here it's plotted in terms of frequency instead of wavelength. Um, and in this case, the silicon vacancy, it's not due to electric fields because it's pretty, um, insensitive due to the symmetry of this defect to electric fields, but it's very sensitive to strain. So each one of these defects in this crystal is at a slightly different energy because of the strain on the crystal. Okay, so even though uh, the defects are slightly different, we have ways that we can try to tune them and also ways that we can alter their properties because they're in the solid state environment. 
And so this is mainly just um, some eye candy to see all the stuff that is going on uh, in the defect or some of the things that are going on in the defect world where they use devices to enhance performance and scalability. And so this is, for example, a photonic crystal that's coupled to an ensemble um, of, um, of eudinium um, ions that act as a quantum memory. My own work looks at NV centers in diamond. Uh, this here is um, uh, silicon uh, vacancy centers in diamond. We also have defects here in silicon carbide, um, erbium ions, which are near telecom wavelength. And this is a nice example of trying to build up a network, in this case, of, of silicon vacancies uh, in, in an integrated format. Okay. So now that we have an idea of what a quantum network is and why we would like to use defects, um, I'd like to move into how we can make it and characterize quantum defects. Because normally defects are things that you don't want and people try really hard to get rid of them. And instead, what we want to do is, is try to make them. And the first way you can make them is just to grow your material and either dope during growth um, or you can um, uh, or uh, when you're or you can just have some impurities that are incorporated unintentionally. And I would like you to look at this. Uh, this is a confocal scan. So what's happening is we're using a, a microscope and, and we're scanning our excitation laser and then we're collecting light. Again, this is with the nitrogen vacancy center uh, in diamond. And where you see a little spot, that's actually where you have one of these point defects in the crystal. And to give you an idea of the types of purities that we're working with in these materials for quantum information applications, um, this diamond is specified to have nitrogen that's less than one part per billion. But because of the studies that we've done on growth, where we know how many nitrogens are typically incorporated as, as nitrogen vacancy, I can do this measurement and I can estimate that in this particular sample, we're at the parts per trillion level of impurities. So almost all of this, almost none of this diamond actually is nitrogen and even less is NV. We can sit and count these nitrogen vacancies and say actually the number of nitrogen vacancy centers is four parts per quadrillion. These defects um, have the best quantum properties and they're actually used uh, in, in quantum protocols, which includes um, a long distance entanglement uh, between two NV centers and also uh, a loophole free test of Bell's inequalities, um, showing the quantum correlation of these of two of these defects. And they've been used by simply finding an NV center like this as quite good and then milling out a lens around it so you can enhance the, the light collection. Uh, curiously, because we can look at these single defects, um, we can track them as we do things to the sample. So this is an example where we've heated up the, the sample and we can get more defects. We can actually form them from existing impurities inside uh, the center just by heating it up. And we can learn something about the temperatures that they form and really get a fundamental understanding of the physics that goes into uh, the formation of these defects. Okay. So these are the highest quality defects, but there's least, least amount of control due to placement. The, the way we make them to have the most type of control is to imp do implantation and annealing. And in this case, you implant. In this case, I'm using, again, the example of nitrogen vacancy centers. We take our diamond, we implant nitrogen ions where we want them. We can have them, for example, going through a grid. And then we do a very high temperature vacuum anneal. And in this case, uh, afterwards, what happens is that the nitrogen uh, substitutes for a carbon site and also the vacancies that formed due to knocking out carbon atoms can migrate to the nitrogen and form that nitrogen vacancy center. And here you can see after implantation, we've only formed these nitrogen vacancy centers where those ions have implanted into the diamond. These defects can also have a charge and the particular charge we want um, is the negative charge. And so we do another step here where we oxygen anneal and spectrally you would see that we converted the charge 
qualitatively just from these microscope images, you can see they got a lot brighter, these defects. And what happened here is the oxygen annealed enabled us to capture an electron and have the right charge state for these defects that we created. So this has the highest control over placements, but the properties um, are, are degraded. And that's the, the optical stability and the quantum memory time. And then another promising aspect of people is to kind of combine the two things that we talked about. In this case, you, you dope, uh, for example, in, in just a thin layer. So you just have the NV centers very close to the surface. And then you do something else to activate it or create the vacancies. So you're doping with nitrogen, and then you can irradiate with electrons to create the vacancies. You can implant with carbon or helium to create vacancies. You can actually just apply heat. So this is like a localized heat or heat with a laser to do the, the extra activation to create them. And these have very good quantum properties. There's moderate spatial control because you're limited by whatever the, usually the vacancy diffusion that you're creating, um, and you're also limited by your, your doping density, and the dopants themselves will be at a random spot. Okay, so those are the different ways that we create them. And then once we create them, we also have to know how they're performing, right? And so this is, um, this is, this is a, this is a, a disclaimer as I want to say and this is an outstanding challenge in the field because there are so many defects with so many different properties uh, in many many different materials all materials uh, have defects all crystalline materials it is really hard to identify the a new defect just from photoluminescence so when I talk today about characterizing it we already assume that we know something about the defect in advance so this is um, an example, of my own work of donors and semiconductors, where uh, we have a, a donor just like phosphorus and silicon. Uh, when you're at room temperature, that electron is donated to the conduction band. But if you go to very cold temperatures, and these measurements were taken at 1.5 uh, Kelvin, what happens is that the electron is bound uh, Coulombically to the positive charge of that of that dopant. So now you have what looks like a hydrogen atom. It's a effective mass solid state hydrogen atom, uh, different from a hydrogen atom in that its Bohr radius is much, much bigger. Uh, for example, in gallium arsenide, the Bohr radius is 100 angstroms, whereas a hydrogen atom is only half an angstrom. Um, and in zinc oxide, that Bohr radius is about 10 angstroms. So these are, these are very large. And what's nice is that in direct band gap semiconductors, so unlike silicon, you do have this optical transition to something called a donor bound exciton. And so here I'm showing four different semiconductors, uh, gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, cadmium tellurate, and zinc oxide, where we plotted uh, the uh, intensity in a color map of the photoluminescence, and it's a log scale so you can see some of the fine structure, um, as a function of magnetic field. And as you do this, what you can see is that the energy levels can shift and split. And these individual lines here are those energy levels that we're gonna use, or those transitions that we're gonna use for the qubit states. Um, it's very obvious uh, in zinc oxide where you see just, just two, two levels in this particular case. And so we can use what we know about effective mass theory and we can understand these splitting and then we can identify those energy levels that we want to use as qubit states and as optical states okay here's another uh, beautiful uh, example um, from uh, about five years ago or so of the community working out the energy level structure mainly using uh, group theory uh, for the silicon vacancy center uh, in Diamond, which is another contender for, for network applications. And you can see nicely how if you know if you know a little bit about it, about the structure and you take these measurements, then you can really understand uh, the energy level structure. We call it the Hamiltonian. And then in this particular case, this level one and this level two uh, would be your qubit states. All right, so once, so once you've done this, this spectroscopy, you now have determined what, what these levels are. And now we have to know 
is it going to be a good qubit or not? And so the first thing that we want to do is understand or create a superposition state, create a qubit state. We're not interested in just having zero or just having one because those are just classical states. And the way you do that is you have a coherent resonant field. So in this case, you're applying um, a radio frequency uh, field to this transition. In diamond in the NV center, it's about three gigahertz. And you can coherently drive this population and you can see that it's coherent because you see, depending on the pulse length, you see the population oscillate back and forth as a sinusoid. So this is an ensemble of, of many, many centers uh, in, in a diamond sample. And then here you can see the similar measurement uh, done uh, of driving or creating this um, qubit state in different superpositions um, for, for a single nitrogen vacancy center. So if you wanted to have the qubit state where half there's half probability in zero and half probability in one, you would stop your drive um, right about here. All right, and so then um, what you can do next is once you stop that drive here, you can measure how long it takes to decay. And this is an example decay curve of, of measuring that lifetime. And this is done at room temperature for the nitrogen vacancy center in diamond and the T2 or the quantum memory time for this particular NV center in this particular sample is around two milliseconds. So the NV center is, is very well understood. Um, we have tools that can measure over very, very large um, and, uh, time scales. And this is really needed for this, this defect exploration for quantum applications because you don't necessarily know uh, what time scale you're going to end up with. And learning these time scales and learning the interactions that are happening in your crystal is, is a huge part of this research. So here I'm going to give a, an example of the time scales that you may encounter. Uh, in this particular case, it's the gallium donor in the crystal zinc oxide. So the energy level structure uh, for the geometry that I'm working in uh, in this case is a little bit more complicated than the one that I saw. There's actually a many, many interconnected uh, couplings from that qubit level to uh, optically excited levels. But the first thing that we can do is create a, uh, create a superposition state and then watch it process in the magnetic field. And this is the Larmar precession. Um, that you see, and what you can see is that this, this qubit uh, processes um, at a, a rate or a time scale of about 10 picoseconds. So very, very quick. And so our way to measure something so quickly, we can't just use uh, microwaves. We actually have to use uh, fast laser pulses in order to detect this very fast precession. Then we can also look at how quickly this uh, superposition state decays. So that is done by measuring the amplitude of this as a function of time. And here you can see that it decays now um, in 17 nanoseconds. So that's not uh, super long, but we're already a thousand times longer than that precession time. Okay. The reason why in this ensemble measurement of many, many donors that this is decaying quickly is that they're all seeing different microscopic environments. We can actually rephase the, the spins doing something called a spin echo by adding a third pulse. And when we do this, we see that now our quantum memory time is 50 microseconds. So we went from tens of picoseconds to tens of nanoseconds to tens of microseconds. And then we also want to know, well, in this material, we're, we're pretty sure we know what's limiting this. It's um, due to, uh, due to uh, zinc zinc spins um, that we're not controlling for that that have uh, nuclear moments. And uh, if we want to ask what is the fundamental limit, the fundamental limit that the spin coherence time or this quantum memory time cannot exceed is the classical relaxation time. That's saying if I create a one state or initialize just into the classical state one, how long does it take to relax to zero? Or if I initiate in zero, how long does it take to, to do it in one? And what you can see here is that for these types of, of defects, gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, cadmium telluride, the donors in these semiconductors 
we can maximize uh, T1 at around one millisecond. For a zinc oxide, and this is one reason why I'm studying zinc oxide, uh, is this is now at 500 milliseconds. So this is the fundamental limit. Uh, we're not there yet in terms of quantum memory time. Um, but we take these measurements uh, as a function of magnetic field to understand the mechanism for relaxation. And in this case, these earlier measurements really said go to low spin orbit coupling material. So we went to zinc oxide and got an increase of, of three orders of magnitude. Okay. And then a lot of people say, all right, well, what, what is what is your goal? How long do you want T2 or this quantum memory time to be for defects for network applications? Um, right now, superconducting qubits uh, are, are around 50 microseconds, and now the record is around 300 microseconds. Because we have cases where defects are exhibiting very, very long coherence times, this is in silicon, mainly in silicon and diamond and silicon carbide, so material that can be made very, very pure. It's pretty safe to say that people don't get really excited unless there is a possibility to get the seconds eventually. So we really want to be in the second time scale um, and of course longer eventually. And so then the next thing, so that's the spin properties. The next thing is the, the optical properties. And what I mentioned before is that we want the photons that each defect to uh, th that each defect emits to be spectrally identical. If we look at this photoluminescent spectra of the nitrogen vacancy center, we see this very, very sharp peak. And we may naively assume that at least for these 3% of the photons that are emitted into this sharp transition, um, they would be identical. And unfortunately for the nitrogen vacancy center, this broadband emission out here is phonon assisted and it turns out to be not useful. So only 3% of the time do you get a photon in this useful transition. But if you zoom in and do very high resolution spectroscopy on this, what you find is that uh, even if you look at a single center, that may be drifting a little bit. The frequency of that emission may be drifting. And what's happening there is that just because you're exciting with an optical laser, you're also exciting defects around it and you're changing the microscopic environment around this defect, which is slightly changing the electric field. And these defects are very, very good sensors. And sensing is an enormous, uh, app, is, a, is a very exciting application of, of quantum, quantum defects, which I'm not going into today, but essentially if you have a very, very good qubit, very, very often you have a very, very good sensor. If we go uh, and increase the temperature here, you can see that each one of these uh, broadens out. This is due to phonon interactions. And for this particular defect, we know that we need to work around uh, less than 10 Kelvin or so. Um, we have ways uh, as a community that we can stabilize uh, this transition somewhat uh, via, via certain uh, optical excitation schemes as well as feedback on that transition. Um, if we just look at one line, what we need to know is that this, this line width, you know, which is about 10 megahertz or so, uh, is Fourier transform limited. So we need to be able to do lifetime measurements on these and look at the lifetime and take the tran Fourier transform of it and back out that we are having a spectral width that's transform limited. So these are just on single defects. Uh, the other thing to note is that if you look at an ensemble of them, so each one of these is a different NV center in a sample, and these NV centers were created by implantation and annealing. So each one is emitting at a slightly different frequency. And so we need a way that we can match all of these frequencies as well. Okay, so these are the types of, of uh, measurements that we do. And then, of course, there, is, there, there are two bread and butter measurements that you have to do. And one is you have to check that you have a single defect, right? You see something that's very bright, uh, it's very stable, um, but you always have to prove that you only have one atom or one type of or two atoms missing in your lattice that creates this quantum emitter. The way we do that in the lab, we take that defect, uh, the photons from it, we split it on a beam splitter, and then we do uh, coincidence measurements. We look at the time delay between a count on one detector and a count on another detector. 
And if this is a single quantum emitter, it can't emit two photons at once. And so if you look at zero time delay here, you should go to, it should go to zero in this case. And so this is an example of something called a G2 measurement or autocorrelation measurement that shows that the photons that are being emitted from this particular defect are coming from just one defect. And then before I talk about how we want these, the photons that are emitted, the spectrum to be Fourier transform limited to the lifetime of the emission or the wave packet, there's actually a measurement that you can do for this as well to test it, not just do lifetime measurements and spectral measurements. And this is by using, um, again, quantum mechanics. If you have two photons that are coming into a beam splitter, there are four to so this beam splitter uh, transmits half the light and reflects half the light. So there's four possible outcomes. Uh, the top gets reflected, the bottom gets transmitted, they both get transmitted, they both get reflected, or the top gets transmitted and the bottom gets reflected. And there is a phase associated with each one of these, and it turns out that the middle two um, have opposite signs, and so they cancel out. So if these only if these are indistinguishable. So in the case of indistinguishable photons, you can only get two photons coming out in one port, two photons coming out, or two photons coming out to detector two, and you should never get a coincidence between these two. And what you observe um, experimentally, so this is, a, is an example from the SIV center uh, in Diamond, is that again, you use G2 now on two different centers, it goes, it goes down, it should ideally go down to zero, um, but going below uh, seeing any type of dip is, is some sign of some indistinguishability that you can then characterize. Okay, so, um, so one of the motivations for making these defects and in, in using defects instead of using ions uh, or trapped atoms is that you can integrate them into devices. And uh, there's, there's several motivations for integrating them. One is catching the photon. It sounds trivial, just, just collect it, but it turns out it's very, very challenging uh, for any of these types of emitters. They essentially emit in four pi uh, directions. And so we, we need to figure out how to catch it and then use the photon for this, creating these networks that I was talking about in the beginning. And then you also are gonna want to alter the properties of the emitter and then and also realize large large networks connect these defects up in a scalable way okay. so one of the ways that you can catch the photon and alter the properties is you can create devices that will um, convince the defect to admit its photons all in the same direction into the mode that that you're collecting in uh, another thing that you may want to do is I mentioned that only 3% of the admission for this nitrogen vacancy center is into this very useful line for creating these quantum networks. You can use devices to enhance this admission so it's a larger percentage of the admission is, is useful for quantum networks. Okay. Um, and so here uh, you see um, state-of-the-art free space uh, devices for creating entanglement. Here is entanglement on demand between two and V centers uh, that are that are in two different uh, cryostats. And then this is the schematic of what things may look like on a chip, where you're going, you know, from from half a room to uh, potentially a uh, hundred microns or so. And so the, the type of platform that I work on is I like to separate out the defect layer from the photonics layer. And so my particular platform, I work with gallium phosphide on diamond and uh, I create uh, photonics using uh, nanofabrication techniques um, and they're created on a diamond substrate where I've also created these nitrogen vacancy centers um, in diamond. And so this is an example of the types of structures that you can make. Uh, if you look here, this little line here is separating out the gallium phosphide uh, from, from the diamond. And these are, these are couplers. So the photon comes down this waveguide and then can shoot up to our microscope. 
these are the equivalent of beam splitters, the thing that the, the light can go both ways, but it they so if a photon comes in this way, it can either exit in this leg or that leg. And then these are actually cavities which efficiently collect uh, uh, photons that are coupled from them. And what's nice is that today with today's uh, computers and electromagnetic software, uh, simulation software, is you really can design these structures and understand what's happening uh, to the electromagnetic fields in, in these types of devices. And so this is this is an example uh, chip where we have NV centers uh, that we created. And uh, in this particular case, when it emits, we come back to here. This is this is actually a resonator. And what happens is when the NV center emits a photon, it emits into this mode and that photon bounces around until it can then um, it can then output into the waveguide and be routed on the chip. And here uh, is an example of the actual experiment where you can excite a single nitrogen vacancy center. You always have to show that it's a single one by, for example, doing a G2 measurement, which I show here. You can tune the cavity onto resonance, um, which means that the cavity uh, round trip for light at the wavelength uh, constructively interferes, and that happens at the same transition as that defect when that happens. So here we're tuning that transition onto the defect transition. And then suddenly we get light from that single quantum defect to efficiently couple into this waveguide and we can collect it somewhere else on the chip after routing it. Okay. And in this particular experiment, as I mentioned before, in normally only 3% of the light is emitted from the defect into that zero phonon line, and it's actually emitted in all directions. You, you only collect a very small fraction of that 3%, and in this particular integrated photonics, 10% of the photons are not just emitted into that very useful mode, but we also showed that it goes into the waveguide where we can then route, route and collect it. So, um, so right now, though, the NV centers, as I mentioned before, are uh, that are created by implantation and annealing and that are going through this device fabrication um, aren't don't quite have the optical properties needed for creating these networks. So we're working on uh, a few more uh, angles. We are certainly working on stabilizing these centers further. We're also designing photonic structures for deeper centers. Um, and we're also asking, are there quantum defects that are more resilient to fabrication? So I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I do want to give um, a shout out to uh, a very active field in nanophotonics, which is inverse design in nanophotonics. And in this particular case, because of our advancements in, in computation and also uh, computational power that we now have, uh, we don't have to design um, photonic devices from the optical principles that 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 we learned um, as undergraduates. For example, there'll be a resonance in the ring when there's an integer number of wavelengths that come around this ring. Okay, so that's a very classical thing. Instead, we can say, all right, you're going to have an arbitrary shaped object any pixel can either be a material or be vacuum and we're going to have an output function that we want this device to do and then we're going to do a massive optimization and the result of this is very high performing devices um, for example um, wavelength demultiplexer from very non-intuitive patterns that come out okay so we recently tried this work we actually got implanted and v centers about 100 nanometers from the surface that were pretty stable so this is if you're in pristine diamond that where the nv's been grown in and here's one that's been implanted um and we asked the same question if we put gallium phosphide on what can we do and this is a, with our collaborators uh at the rodriguez group at, at princeton what can we put or due to that gallium phosphide to preferentially have light come into our collection lens. And this is the kind of beautiful structure that they designed 
um, in our group made. So this is about 1.5 by 1.5 microns um, that you see here. Um, and indeed, you can see if you have a defect that's not under one of these structures, this is about the amount of light that you get out at the zero phonon line. And if you have one that's pretty well coupled, then we can get uh, many more photons out. In addition, we can always confirm that we're looking at a single uh, photon emitter by doing this autocorrelation measurement. Um, in this case, we found even this very mild fabrication where we don't etch the diamond these are very sensitive sensors. They know the, the, the qubit underneath, can, something has happened to its environment slightly. We can see that its line width has broadened somewhat. You can see the scale here is about three times larger. And we're working now on trying to figure out um, what has happened, what happens during fabrication that does this. And so the third one is, are there quantum defects that are more resilient to fabrication? Yes. The silicon vacancy minus is more resilient. It doesn't have this issue with being so sensitive to the electric fields, but it is sensitive to strain. And that means that you can't use electric fields to tune it. Um, it also, for example, has, um, it has to operate at dilution refrigerator temperatures because its spin coherence is not very good um, at, at uh, liquid helium temperatures. It has to operate much colder. Um, there, the rare earth dope crystals are also um, more resilient as well, but they don't have very strong oscillator strengths. And you can go through different defects. There's always a yes, but there's always a but. And what I want to leave uh, people with is an understanding of, or a feeling of just how much goes into what a defect, how a defect is going to behave. Uh, there are the materials properties. This is like the material property of the host, whether you're working with silicon or diamond or perovskite um, or, um, or uh, a 3.5 or 2.6 semiconductor. Uh, then there's the defects itself. Like what, what is the, the, the defect in there, the symmetry of the defect, um, the, the energy levels of the defect. And then there's the, the functionality, like what you want to use this defect for. Is it a spin photon interface for these quantum network applications? Is it a spin transport? Is it a quantum sensor? Is it a single photon source? Is it a spin qubit like the phosphorus in silicon? And so far, uh, the way that the community is mainly working is a historical approach where um, we begin with a specific defect. And often now, it's one that's been identified a, a long time ago by people, you know, pioneers in silicon and, and diamond and semiconductors that, that mapped out some of the ensemble photoluminescence structures. And we go back to that seminal work that they've done and try to isolate singles and determine their quantum properties. Um, so you begin with a material, we then determine the precise structure with, with, with today's modern measurements, and then you identify applications. But we really want to do is start with is to transform this to start with applications. So again, this is like this inverse design, but now not just for a small photonic structure, but for actually making new materials, um, determine desired structures and find these quantum point defects. And many advancements are needed, ab initio calculations, like actually predicting um, how the defects uh, will behave and will form. And this is very challenging on classical computers because these are highly quantum correlated systems that theoretically you would need a quantum computer uh, to do. Um, advancements in structural imaging, materials purity, it's not a coincidence that the highest coherence uh, defects are in silicon and in diamond. Surface science, this is what is hurting device integration. And then quantum screening, all the measurements that I told you about today, for every defect, it takes several, um, several PhDs to really determine um, its properties, and that's really, really slow given the huge parameter space that's out there. All right, so in the summary of today's talk, um, I hope I gave you a, a taste for why defects may be the ideal hardware platform for realizing quantum networks, um, that there are very stringent requirements for both the spin and optical properties for network applications, and there's different, there's going to be different 
requirements uh, often equally stringent or more so for other applications in quantum information science and technology. Um, I showed some of the uh, advances in defect based technologies uh, using integrated photonics and hopefully I, I give you an idea that there's no perfect defect for each application right now, but there really might be. Um, and we, we're now at this very excited point where we can do hopefully start to do rapid defect discovery. And so with this, uh, I would just like to acknowledge uh, the people who really did the work, uh, which are the students in the group, uh, as well as uh, the funding uh, for this work. So thank you. And I'm happy to take questions if there are questions. Okay, so it sounds like there's some technical difficulties um, right now in that the moderator is muted. Um, this is what happens for an inaugural seminar series. Okay, it sounds like yep. someone, someone I, is- I can talking. read the questions if, if we need to, although I am not going to be, I am the non-technical person on the call. Um, <laughs> So the first question was, have radiation induced effects become used for quantum computing applications? So um, yes, if you. Um, so a lot of the defects that we that are made are due to radiation effects. Uh, radiation is a very powerful way to create vacancies. Um, and so for the nitrogen vacancies center in Diamond, uh, electron irradiation is used uh, in this case. Uh, the vacancy center in silicon carbide is another defect um, that is being used. So they are a way to, it, using radiation is a way to create defects. Doing it in a controlled way is very important. Okay, how strong is the correlation between material purity and quantum state lifetime? Or alternatively, how pure were the materials for which you reported lifetime records? Yeah, so um, the so in diamond and silicon, uh, the impurity concentrations Again, these are these are extrinsic impurities, so I'm not sure if you're talking about vacancies, these types of defects. I think that that's trickier to detect. But um, for nitrogen, which is the dominant dopant, it is less than one part per billion. And in silicon, where are these records? Um, that silicon record is is quite an amazing sample in that not only uh, is it very, very pure, I believe, but you should check in the in the paper where this is referenced. Um, this material is at the you know 10 to the 11 per cubic uh, centimeter of of dopant concentrations that are background dopants, and it was also made in entirely silicon 28. So it was also isotope purified uh, to remove a, a noisy nuclear spin bath in this case. Okay. I, that sorry. Go I, ahead. I want to say one more thing is that this doesn't eliminate other other materials, but it does say that we have to be clever. We have to determine what's limiting it, what the what's limiting a coherence to determine whether or not it's worth it to make an investment to higher purity materials in a particular platform. OK. Uh, and then when you grow the material with control defects, wouldn't the intrinsic local stresses be different compared with natural crystal? Wouldn't these stresses get in the way? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so right now, because these are uh, really, really pure materials, the, the defect does create its own micro stress or strain environment, but as long as it's far enough away from another defect, it should have a similar, again, in a perfect crystal, it would have a similar micro stress pure environment. Um, so, so I, I can say a couple things is I don't think it will ever be perfect. 
Right, so if you take really nice diamond that's been annealed uh, and you have defects that are very, very far apart from each other, uh, the optical inhomogeneity is a few gigahertz. And theoretically, it needs to be tens of megahertz. However, you can use an electric field and tune them, easily tune them, those few gigahertz. So they're all spectrally identical. Uh, there's another uh, area of my research that I didn't talk about that's that's very exciting um, when it can become very efficient is that we are now using these same types of nanophotonic platforms are able to do very efficient frequency conversion. And when you do frequency conversion, uh, you are mixing a coherent field uh, to create a new your single photon at a new frequency. And if you have two photons that are different frequencies, and you convert them to the same frequency, it turns out that that erases which defect they were emitted from, this which path information, and you can entangle those two defects that are different. So at the same time, while we're trying to get those materials better, we're also coming up with engineering solutions where the materials don't have to be exactly identical. All right, how, uh, Mike wants to know, how is the phase of the superposition controlled? Yeah, so um, the phase, uh, the phase of the superposition state, um, it's it's controlled about by by when the excitation occurs, right? And then uh, if you have multiple states, then and you have multiple excitation lasers, then all of these all of these um, lasers would need to be would be, need to be phase locked and in sync with each other um, the the only person that has really dealt with this for communication uh, in this case uh, this is this is the Ronald Hansen's group um, in that case they they do uh, stabilize the interferometric uh, path using classical optics techniques all right, uh, Peter wants to know, could you comment on the requirements to the purity of the materials, both in terms of impurities and in terms of other not useful defects? Are there limits on their concentrations? Yeah, so the, the, bad, the bad impurities are, because because almost always you're storing the information in a spin state, uh, the bad impurities are ones that have an unpaired spin. These can be nuclear or they can be elect electronic. And so if you have a nearby ele electronic spin, then you can just picture, you can calculate what the dipolar coupling is of the nearby spin. Um, and if it's frozen out, that's great. If you can freeze it, freeze it out, go to low enough temperature so it's static, um, that will help uh, quite a bit. I would say uh, to do this kind of coherent manipulations, you, you definitely want things below parts per million to start with um, in, in this case. The other, the other thing I would add is one of the issues with these optical techniques is that you can change the environment. So it's not just the defect. Every defect can, many deep defects can exist in multiple charge states. And when you excite your quantum emitter because you need that photon out to do the network application you're actually exciting more than just one lattice site in the crystal you're exciting many many lattice sites if there's a defect there and your optical excitation for example changed its charge state then there's a huge electric field so there's not just the number of defects around it but also how stable is the configuration of the defects to the uh, optical excitation that you're performing in your device Okay, we're going to take the last question. It's from John. Have radiation-induced defects been used for quantum computing applications? Um, so the silicon, I, again, the, the, the vacancy in silicon, uh, in silicon carbide, uh, there's several papers out there. You're always welcome to uh, email me, uh, kaimefu at uw.edu, and I can point you uh, to some papers on radiation-induced defects. 
Yes, and those who ask questions can follow up with Kai Mei too. And thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and energy in giving this presentation and being the first for this seminar series. Be sure to come back uh, and, and check back in a month. We're going to be trying to do these monthly. And um, thanks so much for attending. It was my pleasure to be here. Thank you, everyone. Bye.